APIs or application programming interfaces tell different pieces of software how to communicate with each other. When you click the thumbs up button on a video on YouTube, the application running in your browser knows how to make an API request to the YouTube server, where it will perform an action saying user X liked video Y and persist it in a database. For APIs to work and for developers to be able to build with APIs effectively, it's common to define these APIs using REST and CRUD architecture styles. For instance, the users of my site can be accessed via API at slash users, and a specific user can be found at slash users slash one. This pattern is common across programming languages and frameworks. Some tools like Ruby on Rails are so oriented toward this style that you can write a single line of Ruby code to generate an entire set of scaffolding code which provides REST and CRUD functionality for your application. But as a software project grows, the number of these routes in an API can grow to an unruly size. Software is complex. Take Slack, for instance. There aren't just users, there's messages, channels, servers, organizations, API integrations, and a lot more. Maintaining each of those with the same routing structure is tricky. Many software engineers encounter the same problem, and as sure as we encounter problems in our day-to-day -day work, we're also sure to develop new approaches to solving them. A recent approach towards API design from the team at Facebook has become incredibly popular in the web development community in the last few years, GraphQL. GraphQL is a query language for APIs and a runtime for fulfilling those queries with your existing data. Let's look back at our user's example. An existing API may use the route slash users to return a list of users, and to get a specific user, we may pass in an ID as part of the route URL, such as slash users slash one. In GraphQL, every query to your API happens at a single endpoint. For our purposes, we'll call it slash GraphQL. This is the single entry point to your entire API, regardless of what data you're requesting or whether you're a mobile user, desktop user, or internal user. To tell GraphQL what we're requesting, we can write a query. A query tells GraphQL what pieces of data that we want. For instance, users, but even more specifically, the fields that we want on each user. It's a common requirement of an API to strip fields from a piece of data. You may, for instance, have an encrypted password field on your user that generally doesn't need to be returned with every API request for user data. Instead of defining some sort of middle layer to sit between your database and your users, removing any data that shouldn't be leaked to a client, users of your GraphQL API can just tell it what fields they need and ignore the rest. This is the query language aspect of GraphQL. It looks a little like JSON, but with less syntax overhead. It's super easy to write, and there's a linter built in to most editors, preview services, and tools in the GraphQL ecosystem. So if you write weird looking GraphQL code, it's actually pretty easy to reformat it into something legible. GraphQL queries correspond to functions defined by the GraphQL server. So when I ask the GraphQL endpoint to give me a list of users, the key users will be matched by a corresponding type defined in the server. If the function's users returns an array of user objects, the corresponding type for this function users will be represented as an array of type user. Everything that passes through this GraphQL server goes through the GraphQL type system. My user type, for example, may have an ID, which we can mark as required using an exclamation point. Name can be a required string field, and additionally, I can add an optional string field, nickname, by omitting the exclamation point. In more complex software systems, it's common to introduce the idea of related data. A user on a blogging site, for instance, may have many posts, which contain text and a published at date. To model this in GraphQL, we can define posts as a field on user. Now when we query for users, we can also query for their posts, getting a list of posts for each user returned inside of the user data. GraphQL isn't just for querying, it can also be used as a system for updating data. Perhaps in my previous user's example, I signed up for the service without providing a nickname. But after thinking about it, I have a nickname that I want to add to my user account. Updating data in GraphQL happens with mutations. Mutations are, in a sense, GraphQL queries with side effects. In practice, they look a lot like functions. 
If I have a mutation update user, which takes some input in, that is the data I want to update in my user, I can also specify the data that I want back, representing my new updated user. Mutations also use GraphQL's type system, so my function update user has input, which can be a strictly defined update user input type. Inside of that, I can set a number of fields, specifying nickname as the field that I want to allow to be updated. When I call that function and pass in an object with nickname, it's valid. But if I were to pass ID, it would be invalid because it isn't defined as a field inside of update user input. Much of our discussion about GraphQL so far has been oriented around using a GraphQL server. When I write a query to get a list of users, I also need to define a corresponding function to handle that query and make the actual API request to get the data that I need. These functions are called resolvers. Implementing the resolver function for users can be as simple as making an API request to slash users. In doing so, we connect the GraphQL API to our backend server. This is an important distinction. GraphQL doesn't just magically get your data. You still need to write JavaScript and network request code to get the data that you need. One common issue that developers building GraphQL APIs run into is what's referred to as the n plus 1 problem. Let's imagine that we're building our blog application that we discussed earlier. A post has text and a published at date, and it also has a corresponding author, which is a user. If we render our blog in a user interface, we may want to show the name of the author who wrote the blog post. To implement this, our GraphQL query will get all the posts, and for each of them, it will also specify the author field and the name from inside of it. In doing so, we've created an interface that requires n plus 1 requests one for our list of posts, and an additional request to get the author data for each post. This doesn't scale well and can quickly overload a server or database. GraphQL's solution for this is batching requests. The open source project Data Loader has been built to make this quite easy to implement. To do this, we'll define a set of loaders for users and posts, and when we implement the resolver for our post author, we can load it from the user loader. If the data for a post author isn't loaded, it will make a single request for that user and any subsequent lookups for that user, whether as an author of a post or just looking up the user directly, will go through the data loader, preventing n plus one style issues from occurring. My favorite GraphQL client and server implementation is Apollo. It's a great set of open source tooling that makes it really easy to spin up a GraphQL server with great defaults. And on the client side, the React libraries allow you to make queries and execute mutations on that server. In the full stack serverless series on this channel, I showed how to set up a GraphQL server using my Apollo server template for Cloudflare workers, as well as connecting to it from inside of a React application. If you're interested in taking GraphQL for a spin using a great set of batteries included tools, I'll link that video above. I'm excited about GraphQL. And if you're interested in learning more about GraphQL 2, check out Biconf GraphQL. It's a free live streamed GraphQL conference right here on this YouTube channel on January 31st, 2020. If you're watching this after the conference takes place, I'll link the playlist of all the conference talks above. And if you're watching this before the conference, make sure to RSVP at the above link for your free ticket. There'll be a live chat with the conference speakers and your fellow attendees, so if you can make it, it's really fun to attend ByteConf Live. If you enjoyed this video, make sure to like and subscribe to this channel. We have a ton of content about GraphQL, which I'll link in the description. Thanks and see you in the next video.